Hey everybody and welcome to another video from the Electronic Armory. In this video we're going to explain Kotlin variables, how to define them, how to set or instantiate them, how to cast them, and how they work under the hood. Make sure you subscribe to the channel to get updates on future Kotlin videos as well as other videos on iOS development, game development, and 3D modeling that I have on this channel. So let's get started by using our project from our first video. So let's get started by using our project from our last video. Make sure you watch it if you need help setting up Android Studio. Otherwise, let's jump into it. So the first thing I'm going to do is switch over to Android Studio. I'm going to double click on the title bar here to expand it to full screen. And then what normally you have to do is double click on these files to open them. Well, I just like to single click. And as you can see, this doesn't open the file here on the right. So I'm going to go up to this gear up here in the top left hand corner and select auto scroll to source and then again auto scroll from source and what that allow me to do is as I click once on these files on the left hand side here it'll open it up on the right and likewise if I select from the tabs of all my different files that I have open such as activity main activity main exists in this folder right here under layout and if I select this tab you can see that on the left hand side it is now selected so that's just something I like to do in Android Studio and other JetBrains uh, software like that so the next thing we're going to do is we're gonna select our main activity Kotlin file and let's explain this really quickly before we jump into Kotlin variables now you can see at the top here that just like Java if you're familiar with that and don't worry if you're not but we have this file as part of our package and if you remember this is what we created when we set up our, our project in our last video so just know that all of our code lives in in this case one package and we can access all of that code from other classes all within the same package without having to do anything important here so the next thing we have is import and you can see it's just a couple it's just ellipse here and if I hit this plus button, it'll expand this out to see what other packages we're including. So these packages include other source code that's, in this case, it's defined by Google uh, as part of the Android package, and more specifically in that package under the support v2 app and then app compat activity. And this is for compatibility for earlier view versions of Android. As you can see, when I double click on this, it also highlights the class that we're inheriting from. Now we haven't talked about classes yet, but you can see that in our code that's defined here that we are using this, this code and it just doesn't come out of thin air. We have to have this defined somewhere. We have to let the compiler know where this comes from. And again, that's gonna come from this package. Likewise, we also have one as part of the Android operating system package and then under that we have something called a bundle what we're doing that if we double click on that to highlight it we can see that we're using this bundle keyword here now our on create method or function defined by fun and this is going to be an overridden function we'll talk about this in a future video but just kind of gloss over it it's overriding the functionality for this function on create that exists in the app compact activity so again somewhere in the definition of app compact activity there is a definition for on create and again we're going to override that behavior to create our own behavior for our own application but along with that we get a lot of powerful tools and functionality that we can use within this application. Okay, so again, we're gonna cover this in more detail later, but let's get started defining our first value. Now let's pretend that you wanted to save a number within a storage unit. We're gonna call those variables or values. To define those, we just use the keyword val, and then I'm gonna say some int. I wanna have some integer, maybe an age or something like that. And it's an integer, meaning it is a whole number, these can be positive or negative and I want to set the value of 10 to this variable so that we can manipulate it later I can set that equal to 10 just by doing this and the compiler will know that because 10 here is a whole number that it'll define this as a whole number and we're getting a little warning to say we're not using it yet but if you want to be explicit about what your types are you can put a colon int for integer 
and you can see a little pop-up that we have here for the code complete and it's going to select integer as a cotton language be very careful about choosing any of the java language uh, basics here so there's a couple in here that you might see and let's do one for a double value. So I'm gonna put some double. And a double value is a double precision floating point value. So what that is, let me just show you here. So if you do double, and that's going to equal, let's say 10.5. A floating point is, you can think about it as this way. This point here of this decimal place is able to float around in our value system where it could be in the third place, depending upon if you're counting from the left to right. Etc. Again, the double is a double precision, meaning it has a little bit more precision than a floating point, which we can also create. We can do some float and float there. And of course, these would pretty much be equal to the same thing. If you did need a number that ran out quite a bit, such as this, if you're trying to get very precise with, say, the value pi or some other uh, irrational number like this, that you can draw this out pretty far and with a double precision value you'd get that a lot more precise oh and i noticed that we forgot to tell this that this is explicitly a float so most of the time i won't actually use floats i'll just use doubles um, i don't necessarily need the precision there but what you'll often see is if i do this really quickly sometimes if you're debugging your application and you put in like exact value of 10 you'll get this extraneous one or maybe it's nine 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 etc for your double precisions this is just a property of floats and, and decimal places and so it's often very good practice not to compare two floats to each other because what's going to happen is you're going to get this this imprecision and this exists just as a property of, of floating points so i'm going to change that back to there and one more value that i want to show you is a string value and then the string is just any words that you want to put in here. It can be a sentence. Right, and so now our application is having some data input into it, and we can manipulate these values if we want to. We can add two values together if we need to. So let's say I want a new value, say the sum of a couple pieces, and this is going to be, uh, let's make this a double because we're going to add an integer and a double. So I'm going to have some int plus some double. And now if I made this an integer, um, what will happen is whatever decimal places come after our double will just get truncated. So it'll be a whole value. And that's not necessarily what you want because you lose a lot of precision that way. We can typecast this if we want to. We can say uh, to int if we need to do that. But now what the error is, is we're saying, okay, we're adding a integer and technically another integer, we're casting this to an int. So two integers equal another integer, but that's not what the type that we're defining here. We can implicitly set the type here depending upon what return value is on the right hand side. And what I mean by return value is whatever this expression here returns, and in our case is going to be two integers added together, and that's going to then be assigned here. So if I don't necessarily know the type or I just want to be a little bit implicit about it. I can take away the definition of that type. So if you see here, we explicitly define the type as either a float, string, etc. The compiler knows what these values are before it's compiled. And so the compiler just knows that to set this to type. Now it's best practice to always set your types if you know, just to be explicit about it, to communicate what your intentions are in writing your code. And if you have a question about if I did this, what ends up happening is it'll add the two values together. And then what it'll do is because an integer plus a double is more precisely represented as a double, it'll make sum a double. So if I made this an integer, it'll give me an error. I could certainly define these values well in advance. So I'm gonna have, you know, let's say another int, and this is gonna be of type int. And I can define it down here. You know, maybe you have some some code in the middle here that does some other things, and then now you can figure out what we want to assign to our int uh, to our int value here. So you can certainly do this if you wanted to. 
But if I try to do that again, let's say I have some other code in between here and I say another int, and I want to set that to something else. Now we're going to get a warning here, and that's what that little red squiggly is, and this is very helpful. You can also see that we have a couple warnings within our code for various reasons, but our warning here, if I look on the side here, or if I click on the, the error itself, says value cannot be reassigned, and I can click on this this uh, light bulb. If you don't see the light bulb, make sure that your cursor is on the object itself, not off of it, because it just doesn't work that way. Okay, maybe you have to click one or two times to get it. But then when our light bulb comes up, we can say we can make this variable mutable. What mutable means is it's able to be changed. So you can think about this as mutation or however you want to remember how mutable means. So if I make this variable mutable, you can see that it changed our value, so V-A-L for value, to var, which stands for variable. So variable means that it's a variable, it can change, it's mutable. So now when I do var, another int, and then the type, I can now change that as, as many times as I want to. Now it's best practice to always declare your variables or values as val and not var because with mutability comes a lot of extra overhead for your variables and so we don't want to introduce that overhead unless we need to. So always default to val instead of var and if you do try to change it later on down the code like if the if I was trying to change this to 20 you know, let's say several pages down or hundreds of lines down, I don't necessarily need to scroll up to the definition. I can simply just use that, that light bulb that comes up. And of course, it's going to tell me that this is redundant because I'm setting it to 10 and then immediately setting it to 20. But let's do something useful with these variables to kind of debug what we're doing throughout the application. Uh, if you're familiar with Java and other languages, you can print these values out to the console. And the way that we do that is using the log class. This is a class defined in the Android util package, as you can see here with our autocomplete. So in the Android package under util, we have this log. And if I do dot on this, we have several different log types that we can use. So there's, uh, let me go through these really quickly. So the D log type is going to stand for debug. We have E for error, I for info, V for verbose, W for warning, and then WTF for basically, if you want to know why it's broken or just what's going on, you can use that and it, it kind of stands out and you can filter based on all these different output types. So usually the one I use is just debug. And so if you select that one, what it's going to ask you for as the first parameter is a tag. Now I like to use some tag that's unique to me. So either my initials or because this is electronic armory, EA and comma and if you notice it automatically put in this parameter name now this parameter name is not text that just comes in automatically as i start typing in this string ea and then comma separated parameters i'm going to put in what i actually want to uh, put in here so if i try to spit out the value of another int it's going to give me an error because what it's expecting is a string that i'm inputting so i can simply just typecast this to uh, not to that, but a string, I hit enter too early. And this whole expression here is what we call a function. So this is code that we reuse over and over and over again. We're passing it some values so that it can be dynamic. And then we're going to want that function to spit out to the console to string here. All right, and then I'm reassigning another int here to 20. And I'm just going to copy and paste that below. Actually, let me kind of organize my code a little bit so you can see that these this block is more logical put together. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and save that and I'm going to rerun the application, pull up my emulator from our last video, and you can see that our application did absolutely nothing. However, what it did do is in the background, if we go back to Android Studio and let's see, yes, we got it for Insta run, thank you. If we go to our log cat down here, so six down here, we can see the output of our application and how that's been affected and what's been outputted from our application. Now your output might get lost within this big sea of output. That other code within Android is, is 
putting out there. But if you do search, you can see D slash EA. So the D stands for that debug, if I go back here. So the debug statement and then the tag that we used, EA in our case, and then the values of our variables as we print them out. Now, if you don't want all this other stuff, we can see that we have a, a debug statement for the OpenGL renderer. We have the EGL emulation stuff being, and this is not very useful for me. So if you go over here to the filter setting and you type in whatever your tag is, it'll filter out all the, um, the tags that have that EA in there. Or instead of verbose, which is everything, I can limit that down to debug. And debug has several different layers. So as part of debug, we also have info as well. So that's why that's showing up here. But as you go through your career in programming, what you're probably going to want to do is format this string a little bit better so that it's you know what this is printing out. Because if you have 100 statements in here saying 10 and 20 and various numbers, you don't necessarily know what those values are. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you string interpolation, which is just a fancy way of saying that I want to put values within an, a larger string itself. So one way to do that is if I create a string around this, and you can see that it now adds a MSG or message tag to my parameter to let me know that this parameter that I'm entering in here is my message part, and this is the tag part, of course. Now, this will just literally print out that string. It won't actually print out the value that you see down here. So the symbol that I use is the dollar sign, but what this is going to do is it's just gonna print out the value of this one as a string, and so it'll print out 10 the first time, but then it's going to do something silly and print out as a string dot to string with these parentheses, etc. And actually, let me uh, oops, uh, switch this parenthesis to the end here. So we close our function. Again, we have to have an opening and closing parenthesis there. And so what I need to do is I need to enclose this entire thing in curly braces. So I'm going to start with the back one here and then put in the, the first one. And then I guess get rid of that. All right, so everything wrapped in these curly braces is going to be evaluated and then printed out as a string. But the reason I'm doing this is because I want to say... I want to actually put in a string here and say the value of another int is colon space and then whatever the value is as a whole. So this will be interpreted as that. So let's go ahead and rerun our application. I'm not going to bother switching over to our emulator. We should just see this down here and voila. We have our debug statement, the value of another int is 10. And then of course we didn't do that for this debug statement. And of course it just spits out the value there. So this is just a nice way of formatting your output to let you know what your values are throughout the execution of your application. All right, so don't worry if most of this didn't make sense. We'll be covering this in depth and reiterating this over and over and over. And this is just meant to be an introduction to variables and values if you're unfamiliar with them in Kotlin. And if you're new to programming, again, we'll be going over this plenty of times over and over again. So make sure you keep watching the next videos and we'll dive deeper and deeper into all these different concepts and topics. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them there. Again, make sure you're subscribed to this channel to get future Kotlin videos and other videos on this channel. Share this video amongst your friends as it really helped me out. And we'll see you in the next video. Thanks.